Welcome to After the Pool, the video series where I share my thoughts and opinions on the comic books that I read for the current comic book week. This will be the last week of the abbreviated version. Tennis summer camp is over, but it's the last week of summer for my kids. Uh, so I'm going to be spending some time with them, going to see Deadpool a movie today. So yeah, I'm really excited, guys. So if you love daily comic book content, if you love me helping you make decisions on what comic books to buy, you came to the right place, guys. Also consider going on to MutantBeaverComics.com. Over 4,000 exclusive variants in their store. Great customer service. Awesome packaging. And if you use my promo code CORNER10, not only can you save 10% off of that first purchase, but every other purchase after that. So again, MutantBeaverComics.com. So with that being said, let's get started with this week's episode of After the Poll. So the first book that I'm going to talk about this week is a book that came out last week, but my shop didn't have it by the time I got there. And this is Sacrificers. This is issue 10. I got to remember to put it on my pull list. This book is 20 pages, $4. It's written by Rick Remender. The art is done by Andrea and Andre Lima Aruhu. <laughs> um, yeah, we know. We know by now I am with the names, right? But, but anyway, the art in this comic book is absolutely awesome. The emotions that go into characters' faces are brilliant, and it really immerses you into this world, right? And in this issue, we tackle the character of Saluna on what happened to her after she got affected by, which looked like some kind of symbiotic goo, right? It went like inside of her she digested it it looks like she woke up and the next thing we know is that she is starving she's begging for food people don't recognize her they don't think she's a god she's an impersonator and she goes to sleep and all of a sudden you get to see what this creature that's inside of her does to an entire town right and the cliffhanger at the end of that issue was awesome so i love how this book goes back and forth now between pigeon and saluna and the cliffhanger makes you go oh my gosh is this family going to help her and what's going to happen with the family absolutely brilliant series i love it again rick remenders writing some great books right now we'll talk about another one of his books later but this one was an a plus i was so engaged I love this. It took me into the world once again. Blood Hunt. This is issue five, the final issue of this event. 36 pages, $6. Uh, Jed McKay, Pepe Larez does the artwork in this. Overall, the artwork has always been really good when it's come to uh, the Blood Hunt events. The, the, the creatures, the vampires, the heroes, the action, everything is always like right in your face. It's a lot of fun to look at. If you get the Red Band editions, right, that, that book always has a little bit more added gore or a page or two for the dollar. So let's talk about this event and some of the things that it accomplished here. Now, if you don't care about the event and you want to get uh, spoiled and find out what's going on in the Marvel Universe, then you can continue to watch. If you did not read it and you don't want to get spoiled, then please wait till the next book. Just fast forward to the next book. So let's see what, what what's accomplished in this. So this was for me the best issue since issue one when we got all that crazy action and the, the skies go dark and it's an apocalyptic situation, right? And here we get the conclusion and it sets things up for the future. This is one of the few events that I feel like is doing that, right? Um, even though it was like less issues than a lot of events and it felt like it tried to compact a lot of stuff, it still managed to do things and the tie-ins, some of them were okay and some of them were not so okay. But the overall grand scheme of things to set things up in the future, it did a good job. So number one was obviously Blade winds up getting cured from being possessed by that ancient uh, vampire-like creature, right? So we wind up getting to see that in here. The next thing is we wind up getting to see the return of Moon Knight. So obviously Jed McKay set up the death of Mark Spector to help 
solve the situation in this vampire situation that was going on. So he was brought back to life, okay? So there's your next thing. The third thing in this comic book is that we wind up getting uh, Dr. Doom, who's becoming a, uh, a Sorcerer Supreme, which I think is going to set up a Dr. Doom event in the future. And the way that happened was actually kind of cool as well, as we got to see uh, him dupe Dr. Strange in this issue going, I'll be, you know, Sorcerer Supreme, and when I solve this situation that's going on, or when I save the Earth, I'll make you uh, Sorcerer Supreme again. And so Dr. Strange, like, trusts him, and then uh, Lord Doom just does something that, of course, he would do. He's He just doesn't... There's a caveat to it. It's like, oh, well, the world is kind of safe from this situation, but not every situation. So I'll give it back when, yeah, everything is solved. So he's sort he's of supreme right now, and I think that's kind of cool. I like that. We haven't seen Dr. Doom in quite some time, so that was awesome. And then the other little weird thing is now is that all the vampires that are in the Marvel Universe are now Daywalkers like Blade. So that's the kind of thing that I'm like, eh, that's not so cool. I don't know if I really want that, but that's what's going on over there. So at the end of the day, I thought that this book, this conclusion was actually pretty good. I'm gonna give this one a B, a solid B. I thought it was a fun read. The overall event was a little bit below. It was a, like average to, you know, maybe just above average if you look at all the issues combined and you had those tie-ins. But uh, yeah, it was a good conclusion to an okay event. And we'll see what happens now with Dr. Doom being Sorcerer Supreme. Absolute Power Task Force 7. This is issue 3. 32 pages for the price of $4. This book is written by Jeremy Adams, which I was really interested to see what this book was about since he wrote it. Marco Santucci? Santucci? <laughs> is the actual artist here. Uh, art is fine. It's, it's definitely serviceable. Uh, the parts where it gets pretty good is like obviously when we see the Amazo... Uh, robot absorbing Alan Scott's powers in here. Uh, I thought that was really showcased nice. The coloring was really good in this book. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it looked great. Uh, and what Task Force 7 is, is about showcasing all the different Amazo robots on absorbing powers and how it affects them as these robots because they are not the perfect bot They're actually flawed in very many ways based off of the superheroes power And I think Amanda Waller is actually experiencing this and she's starting to see the trend here Okay, so in this comic book there are a lot of characters. There's a lot of the JSA characters in here so like you get um uh, for instance, what is it? You get Stargirl in this co comic. You get Wildcat in this comic. Uh, there's there's all kinds of different characters. So it clutters it with, with characters. And in the meantime, we wind up getting to see Alan Scott really trying to explain not only to his fellow, like, say, JSA members... Uh, right in in a van when they're driving but to the reader as well in case you haven't read it which i think is okay but it can bog down the comic and really you just get to see this comic focus on the amazo robot absorbing alan scott's powers and how it's making him try to make the right decision right uh so i thought that was kind of cool and it was kind of cool to see his programming going do I want to kill Amanda Waller or do I not want to kill Amanda Waller? Do I want to kill Alan Scott? Do I do want to kill uh, Alan Scott? So it was kind of cool stuff. I thought this guy was kind of cool. The Alan, not the Alan Scott, Angle Man. He reminded me of like um, Kick Ass in the comic books. I was like, who's this generic guy, right? So it was uh, it was an all right book. It was kind of cool. Just seeing the heart of alan scott i think is the point of this comic book and him reasoning with the robot at the end was kind of cool so at the end of the day this was all right this was fine this for me was probably a, a c plus it, it was a lot of dialogue but the focus on it is to showcase the strength and the character here of alan scott Ultimate Spider-Man, issue 7. This is a 28-page comic for the price of $5. 
written by Jonathan Hickman, and Marco Cicchetto does the artwork. This is definitely the superior Spider-Man comic as of right now, guys. The artwork in this comic looks absolutely phenomenal. The characters look great. The attention to detail looks great. The facial expressions look great. And you just, again, get immersed into this universe. And even though you can tell that Hickman is writing this, especially with the pages where they talk about a lot of the suits and how the mechanics of the suit work. It's very integral that you pay attention to that because it's going to set things up in the future when it comes to Harry and um, Peter going forward in here. And Otto Octavius' character is just like creepy dark like you can see that he totally nerds out when he goes into explanation of the suits right but uh this is again very integral we also learn a lot about uh jay jonah and ben parker that they kind of have an inside source now of or an outside source i guess to get information about what's going on with the daily bugle and all this other stuff and i thought that was really cool so there's a lot of little different elements going on in this comic but the biggest thing in this book was that peter and harry decided to turn on the ai aspects of their suits so it's like another element to them and when you read what the suit is talking to them it's like say peter has a venom or a symbiote suit attached to him and for harry it's like his dad is talking to him so how is this going to have an influence on our heroes in the future to be continued of course but this is definitely planting the seeds on things to come this book is awesome it's an a plus top pick for me and like i said earlier definitely the superior Spider-Man comic book on the shelves today. Gromits, this is issue three, 32 page comic for the price of $4, written by Rick Remender. The art is done by Marino Denicio. This book is awesome. The way the characters look in this comic book are great, man. The facial expressions really bring them all to life. Uh, there's so many fun things to look at because this book does take place in like the mid 80s and this is a book about skaters right and when i was a kid i was a skater i wasn't very good at it right i was kind of like the poser kid from the very first issue but uh i could relate to all the stuff that went on in this comic book it's definitely like a coming of age book uh, we get to see these kids ditch school, they go to the arcade, they get stoned, um, you know, they, they, they fantasize about these girls uh, that they want to hang out with and have a house party with, uh, which I thought was really funny as well. Uh, and all the Easter eggs in this comic book is brilliant because they're hanging out at an arcade. We get to see like Ms. Pac-Man, Dig Dug, games like Zaxxon. There's even Punch-Out in this comic, Joust, and just all the characters' personality is amazing. And what this book does, like Sacrificers, is it sucks you into their world, to that carefree, I don't give a shit, type of world and you forget everything that's going on and you're part of these kids that's when a book grabs you that's when you know this is a top-notch book if you can relate to this book it really does that now how is it for you if you were not grown up in this time frame i'm not sure but i still think that this is a well-written book to where you can really enjoy it right so for me this book is an a plus a top pick for me that's right guys i love every single character i love everything that they're going through i love how they're trying to have this house party right at the end of the day with hanging out with these girls one kid needs a job otherwise he's going to be thrown out on the street and i'm curious to see how this thing will end up it's seven issues so we still got quite a bit of story to go but i love it guys and if you haven't checked it out yet i recommend it man i don't think you'll be disappointed the amazing spider-man this is issue 54 the mind blazing conclusion 
of easy being green. Legacy numbering, 948, 28 pages for the price of $5. Zeb Wells is the writer, as we know, but Ed McGinnis does the artwork in this comic book, and the artwork is great. I absolutely love the way the comic is in here. If Ed McGinnis did the artwork in every single issue, which I think he is doing on the on the uh, new uh, Joe Kelly little story there, I you know th that would be fine with me. I think he's a great artist. He accomplishes what he needs to do. Um, panels are pretty big. It takes up lots of space on the pages, so I feel like it eliminates a lot of story. Uh, but it's cool to see the artwork, right? So let's talk about this. This is the conclusion to Peter, Peter Parker kind of no longer going to be the Green Goblin because the sins seem like they can kind of go anywhere first, right? First it was like Norman Osborn, then it went to the Goblin Queen or Queen Goblin, whatever she is, Dr. Kafka. Then it winds up being pulled out of I think her and it goes to Craven and then it came from the staff and goes back to Craven and then it goes to Peter because there's this mind thing in here. And in this issue, it literally goes back and forth through the entire book. Like it's some kind of like entity or symbiote. And that is the problem I have with this story. I think the story itself, when it comes to, I guess, I don't know, Green Goblin coming back was okay, but, and him absorbing those sins, but for it to go back and forth, like, wasn't his whole thing created by a formula? How does it take on an entity of its own? Like, that doesn't make sense to me. It just doesn't, right? And then there was a situation in this comic which pissed me off some more, and I'm sorry if I'm, like, overcritical of this comic book, but I'm called the Spider Slayer for a reason. I love Spider-Man. I really have a lot of passion for the character. I'm not normally negative towards comic books, and I always find a positive, right? I, I, I'm finding the positive in this comic book right, with the artwork, right? But there's there's got to be a flaw here, and there is definitely a flaw in this in this story and in this run altogether. We continue to obviously get Ms. Marvel in here, right? And she has the Dr. Octopus arms, which I don't agree. It should be another thing that goes from person to person and that you can control. The Octopus arms are arms that belong to a villain, and an iconic villain, and which makes that villain special. She should not have control of them. It's not something that you can just master. These arms were attached to this man, to this guy for many, many years, right? So anyway, she comes across Craven the Hunter here. Most famous hunter, guy can kill anything, anybody at any point in time. And off panel, we don't even get to see it. Miss Marvel defeats Craven the Hunter right here. Like really guys like come on man like that to me that's rough but at the end of the day peter parker succumbs to the whole situation of the sins being taken over his body and with a little help of the living brain uh he's able to break free and the sins no longer exist which means and you see that in this page right here which means, technically, the Green Goblin is dead forever. Because if it's because of the sins of which makes Norman Osborn the Green Goblin, then there's no Green Goblin. How does he return, right? Listen, this book is far from perfect. Not even close to perfect in many people's eyes. And I don't like being a toxic person, but there's certain issues that just don't work and the story doesn't make sense. And to me, this story just doesn't make sense, right? So I don't think this is the worst thing I've ever read. The Miss Marvel story arc was the worst thing I ever read, right? And her coming back and drawing that whole story out forever, ever, and Paul, and I know I'm ranting on and I apologize. It's because I'm kind of trying to come up with a grade here. So I think I'm gonna give this one a D plus. I think that's fair. I think the story has so many bad 
twists and turns and it's just like we gotta get to a point to end this story arc so we can get to Zeb Wells final story arc but I am just real curious across the board guys what did you think of the Amazing Spider-Man issue 54 and the conclusion to this story arc am I being too hard or am I being fair let me know in the comments below so there you have it, webheads. There are my thoughts on some of the comic books that I read for the current comic book week. Next week, you'll get the return of the long edition. So hopefully you'll st uh, stay tuned for that. And as always, guys, make sure you support the local comic shops. Keep buying, keep collecting, but always remember, read your comics so we can have great comic conversation. Guys, thank you so much. I'll see you on the next one.